2020, 2021, there was just a bunch of me too software companies that we really couldn't tell the difference between that business and a business that we just saw last week, but somehow they have 5 million in revenue and getting valued at like 500 million. Hey folks, this week I am super pumped to be speaking with Mumi Q, Managing Director of PSP Growth, where she leads PSP's Venture Capital and Growth Equity Initiative, working closely, of course, with the esteemed Penny Pritzker former United States Secretary of Commerce and American billionaire businesswoman with family investments in the Hyatt Hotels and Marmon Group, among others. From Momi's leadership lessons working with a trailblazer like Penny, to building a robust venture and growth practice, to the future of B2B SaaS despite valuation slashes we've seen. We cover it all, and as usual, you don't want to miss it. I didn't come from the finance world initially. I was a computer engineer by training. Uh, and the, one of the earliest influences that I had was in college when I was building computers and I saw some of the world's best technologies were housed in the labs and unable to be commercialized uh, because they did not know uh, from a business angle how to target customers, how to drive growth, how to drive revenue. And so even when I was in school where I attended University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, uh, during my second year, I added a second major uh, in finance. And uh, I've made it my goal to make sure that the best technologies will get into the hands of users and decommercialized. Um, for a few years in between, I spent uh, a few years in healthcare IT, where this was probably um, even more important as you think about healthcare and saving patients' lives. You definitely want the best technologies and the best inventions uh, to be commercialized. So um, that's kind of how my tech and finance world got together, which is in deep down, I have a passion for technology. Yeah, and if you think about your different chapters, right, and we wouldn't go into too much of it, but with Merrill Lynch, with BCG, what were some of your key takeaways? I mean, you know, these uh, institutions are pretty large and you had almost, uh, you have multiple clients, you had an eagle eye view. You know, what, what did you take away from these different chapters? If yeah, so my, uh, my goal for being a part of the, a lot of these early institutions was exposure. And I think one of the reasons that I went into investment banking and not necessarily straight into engineering or a product role was uh, investment banking was one of the few careers where as a 22 year old, when arguably you might have no value add, uh, you get to work on some of the most exciting deals um, that are real, uh, that touch people's lives, um, that are large and uh, influential and consequential. What was unexpected about you know those different chapters for you? Well, the first thing that was unexpected was I joined Merrill Lynch in 2008. Uh, so I was part of the last analyst class at Merrill Lynch, and uh, that was a very unexpected time because I was full of excitement, um, graduating college, going to New York City, again, working at an iconic firm like Merrill Lynch that was, I think, 108 years old. And then the minute that we become the first year analyst class, then we get acquired. So that was a mix of um, I would say, yeah, definitely unexpected, but also disappointment because I really, I joined investment banking because I loved what I saw and I loved some of the mentors that I had early on who had investment banking careers. But on the other hand, that was the reason that I went into venture capital uh, pretty soon after. And so, um, so, so 2008, early 2009, when the world looked like it was crumbling in the financial crisis, I reached out to really some other banks as a way of seeing what my backup options might be if Merrill Lynch didn't end up surviving. Um, and serendipitously, because life is funny that way, um, I talked to a smaller bank who uh, called Sias Capital. Uh, it's a small bank here in Chicago. I said to the founding partner, hey, I would still like to do investment banking, um, but we don't know what the future of Merrill Lynch is going to be. And he said, you actually have a really interesting background of both engineering and the finance world. Would you like to explore venture capital um, as a different career path? Because I happen to be shutting my bank down, but I am launching a new venture fund where we get to work with founders and inventors. And I think you can have a great background for it. Uh, and, and this is 
quite a common path, right? A lot of bankers, especially from the IBD, uh, investment banking division, actually go into venture. Um, how did you find that transition? Was it difficult for you? Did it feel very natural? It's not an uncommon path. I would say it's not as common at such an early age because uh, I did banking for about a year at Merrill Lynch before this opportunity presented itself. And um, I would say it was it was fascinating. Um, mm-hmm. the, the fund was at a stage where we were structured more like a merchant bank than a traditional fund where we were fundraising at the same time that we were providing some advisory services to entrepreneurs when they could become potential portfolio companies. And so we dug deep into helping some of these founders launch businesses at the earlier stages. And these are inventor, deep tech type of uh, businesses and founders. And so just to give a couple of examples, um, we worked with one founder who invented reflective surfaces, like what, what you see on traffic signs. And that can be applied to microfluidics and um, all the other things where microstructures uh, might be applicable. And my role as part of that was to help them build their business plans. A lot of them did not have, um, again, this is this is why I really moved to venture capital with a business where some of the best technologies don't really have a way or a well thought out process for commercialization. And so some of for some of these companies, we took invoices um, and I built a financial mm-hmm. model out of them. Um, and most of them, I wrote 10 to 15 page uh, business plans to help them think through strategy, but also eventually for capital raising if they need that capital. And so even though it was a venture fund, um, a lot of my work was around business building, founders uh, using that lens. And that was um, something that I fell in love with and never turned back from. Do you think that's sort of, uh, you know, a lot of the the skill set that you bring to the table as a venture investor is that, you know, being able to see both on the balance, as you said, right, from an engineering point of view? I think that definitely helped um, my perspectives around uh, people that are building the products um, and looking at the science, as well as uh, looking at things from a business model. Um, that's a cool technology, but does it actually make money? And on what time frame? Um, and I think I benefited from lots of deferring perspectives from a young age, and that translated into my career even now. And so um, maybe rewinding a little bit. So my, my parents were, were filmmakers. Uh, so I was born mm. in Beijing, China, and um, our family immigrated to Oregon when I was nine years old. But my parents in a, in a prior life uh, made films. My dad was a cinematographer, and then my mom did sound recording. Um, I took an early interest in computers and science, uh, and I was also doing sports. And so I kind of, I would say sports, arts, because of my parents, as well as technology, were big pillars of my life from an early age, but they were all very different. And so in all three opportunities uh, came proactively to me. I wasn't really looking for a new job at the time, but they fit my career at each inflection point. And so um, when Baird reached out, uh, it was during a very prolific time in their in their fund where, so I did 13 deals in two years. And wow. back to the exposure uh, topic that we talked about earlier, I thought it was really important for me um, at a young, earlier stage in my career just to have as much exposure to deals as possible. So the fact that I saw that Baird had a lot of deal flow um, was really interesting. I also got hired as the first associate working across uh, four partners across two different sectors. And so uh, transition wise, it was it it was pretty easy um, because we were looking at the same things in terms of founders, product traction, um, funding. uh, But it definitely developed more of my muscle in terms of uh, just looking at a bunch of but a bunch of like, VCs are about pattern recognition, right? So seeing a lot of patterns, see, seeing a lot of successes as, a, as well as failures and shaping my investment views accordingly, that was one of my big takeaways from Baird. Um, and then PSP uh, was also at an interesting time when, um, so the, the quick background of how PSP growth started was, it's, it's a really great story, uh, which is, so PSP is, is Penny Prisker's um, private investment group. Uh, Penny Prisker, as as you and others may know, uh, very successful um, 
uh, entrepreneur, businesswoman, uh, leader, philanthropist. And uh, so first of all, it was the opportunity to work for someone that inspiring. That was that was sort of number one. Um, but the second piece is she was building something from the beginning. So it was almost like for all my time working with entrepreneurs, there was an opportunity to build something within PSP. Um, and that was really exciting to me. So the Prisker family, uh, their roots are in uh, real estate and industrials. Um, so probably most well known for the founding of Hyatt Hotels and Marlin Group, but lots, dozens of businesses over several decades uh, within that. Um, and then Penny became Secretary of Commerce under President Obama. And during that role, she looked at a ton of digitization initiatives uh, across different industries, liaisoning with all the Fortune 500 CEOs. Um, and coming out of that, uh, had a you know she's always had a passion for technology entrepreneurship, but really um, dove in two feet in in terms of technology is really important for the backbone of our country, driving our workforce, driving job creation. So the fact that she wanted to go all in to make technology a big part of PSP and the opportunity to join her at the beginning of that was um, just something that, that I didn't think I could pass up. This week's recommendation is Make It Happen Monday, hosted by John Barrows, brought to you, of course, by the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. Make It Happen Monday offers actionable sales tips to close more business with insights from industry leaders and, of course, host John Barrows himself as a leading B2B sales trainer and founder of J. Barrows Consulting. An episode that I enjoyed, that I think you will too, is the one with Dr. Howard Dover, the economy, tech, and education triple threat, where Dr. Dr. Howard Dover, the sales coach and director of Center of Professional Sales at the University of Texas in Dallas, explains why there's still plenty of opportunity in sales for those who reach out and take it. Dr. Dover believes that rising interest rates, technology, and ineffective education have created a serious problem in the sales profession, but there is still light at the end of the tunnel, thank God. Listen to Make It Happen Monday wherever you get your podcasts. I love that. I want to go um, a couple of ways here. I mean, you know, Penny is, of course, a trailblazer in many ways. In fact, I was just tuning into uh, one of her stories where she related about her late father passing away quite suddenly uh, at the age of uh, 39 from a heart attack, and she was 13. And in fact, um, had a very close relationship with her grandfather, who um, in the beginning did not involve her in the business. Mm -hmm. But she had requested to her grandfather in green stationery, hey, grandfather, why is it that uh, you don't involve me in the business? You know, I really want to learn more about this. Of course, they were known for the Hyatt Hotels, and this was her purview after her father passed. In many ways, she's a trailblazer in truly male-dominated industries. What is it like working with her, you know, from the early days and building something? It's really amazing to work from, for someone like Penny. The story that you reference, I love that story. Um, uh, for, for many reasons, I think one is being a trailblazer, like you mentioned, is just very rare, right? I think if you remembered, her grandfather's response was, how am I supposed to know that girls want to do business, yeah, right? Which is, exactly. which, is, which is very real. And these days, I feel like a lot of us talk about self-advocacy. I think many years ago, people didn't really talk about that, but that's kind of her first example of self-advocacy, right? If you don't ask for something, you might not get it. Um, and then uh, you, you may know this too, but um, she also co-founded uh, many, many companies back when there was not a lot of women founders and they've all become big successes. But that was all stuff that I sort of knew, you know, before joining. That's what attracted me to PSP. I would say working with her on a daily basis, I am um, just always shocked at how um, grounded she is because of all her success. Uh, so she's very down to earth and also her work ethic. Um, so for everything she's accomplished, she's still, I think her day is back to back 30 minute meetings and uh, super involved in all of our companies and we have a lot of them. And I'm pretty sure the first conversation I have with her each morning, she probably already ran 10 miles. And so wow. just like the pursuit of excellence in all areas of her life, uh, even after achieving the success that she already did. That's um, one of my main things is I need to be working with inspirational people. You knew coming in that you were dealing with an overachiever. And this was also during an interesting time. And she's spoken publicly about this when the Pritzker family, who are very well known in America, were sort of deciding to divide their assets, figure things out and all that. And she was probably trying to also build her own identity with PSP. What was unexpected in all of that? 
Yeah, um, you, you're right. So maybe before going to the unexpected piece, uh, that was one of the things that attracted me to this opportunity is it's a new chapter within PSP and, and for her too, and to just be able to play a role in at that inflection point um, uh, is it was just something that was really, really exciting. Uh, so what was unexpected? So PSP, we have strategies beyond venture capital. So first, uh, we have uh, a real estate team that invests in multifamily and industrial properties, uh, sort of a continuation of all the real estate activities that her and her family has done over the years. Um, we also have a private equity group that invests in more mature buyout type transactions. And we also have um, a funds and partnerships team that invests in other managers of funds. And so venture was coming in as the new piece of the strategy. Um, and I heard some cautionary tales uh, when I came in in terms of, hey, if you look at corporate venture, right, there's a lot of cautionary tales around that when you have the oversight of a parent company and things are slower, things don't really get done, you can't really drive your own agenda. Um, we, I've heard conversations on there's been other growth or venture strategies started within private equity and it never works because it's a different type of mentality, different type of business. And lastly, on the LP side, once you become an LP of a fund, then you don't really get the correct deal flow. So there's a lot of stereotypes mm -hmm. and again, cautionary tales about building something so transformative and risky uh, within a more traditional organization. And I came in thinking I had to um, defend my ideas, defend my strategy and really build my own identity. And in some cases I did, but I've been pleasantly surprised the unexpected piece of how collaborative everyone has been um, and how much better it has been to unlock the power of the whole platform. And yes, while I occasionally have to answer the question of why are your companies valued at 15x revenue and we're trying to fight for companies valued at 15x EBITDA, um, the majority of the time it's been very collaborative, very additive. Uh, just to give a couple of examples, um, our real estate team can sometimes be a customer of the real estate technology mm -hmm. companies that we invest in. So it's an added strategic angle. Our private equity team, um, I learn from all the time in terms of how do you professionalize sales, professionalize operations, professionalize your go to market in terms of if you want to go to do inorganic growth. Um, so I, I share those insights to my uh, CEOs all the time on the venture side. Um, and then our part, funds and partnerships team, we're talking to a lot of the same VC partners because um, they're in the same ecosystem and they're good sources of deal flow for us. And so we collaborate on them all the time in terms of here are all the things we can partner with you. We can be a fund investor in your group. We can also invest alongside your portfolio companies. We can also lead new rounds for your portfolio companies. And so um, that's been a um, that's a, that's been a very pleasant surprise in terms of how well the group has worked together when the strategies are so different and people's backgrounds are so different. Yeah. Love it for the purpose of our audience here who may not be as familiar. When you think about sort of uh, the assets under management, is the primary you know sort of uh, driver of the group still in real estate, or how big is venture as a part of that, and how do all the different entities work together? Yeah, so we all we all talk to each other all the time, um, and uh, so as a larger group, a subset of us would meet a couple times a week, um, and this is across the whole platform. Uh, everyone from Penny, the leadership, um, venture, PE, real estate, uh, funds and partnerships team. And um, this is our way of really stepping back from the shoes of our individual siloed investment strategies and thinking of what are some of the macro implications? Um, what are some of the, the drivers within real estate, for example, return to office, workforce, um, that should, we should be aware of? Uh, what are other funds doing um, that we may be able to learn from? And um, so we do that multiple times a week. And that's one of our differentiators when we talk to founders is there's a lot of great specific VC investors or PE investors or fund investors, but not a lot of groups that has vantage points across all the different asset classes as well as from a macro side. From a uh, allocation perspective, all the investments come from the same balance sheet. And so while each group has rough benchmarks around um, check sizes, so for example, our private equity group tends to write 100 to 300 million checks per investment and on the venture side is anywhere from I would say five to 35. Uh, those are just guidelines. Um, and that's one of the beauties of, of working at um, uh, a non-traditional fund, which is 
in a year, if we see 10 opportunities we're excited about, then we can do all 10. If in a year we see no opportunities, then we don't really have the pressure of having to deploy capital. Uh, it's one, it's, it's one uh, group of capital and may the best opportunities win. Wow, wow. And and remind me again, because, you know, my uh, from the outside, I think it, it seems very institutionalized, right? The way that mm -hmm. and professional, the way that it's run beyond a typical, you know, family office in some way. Is there external ca LP capital or is it all the family money? Yes, this is all the family's money, all of Penny's right. money. All of Penny's money. I love yeah. it. I love it. We talked a, a little bit about this, you know, in terms of looking at macro conditions and balancing that out. Actually, I just spent some time with a couple of family offices in Texas. And when I look at a lot of their allocations, a lot of it is pretty high weighted in real estate, which is deemed to be uh, more stable in some way. How are you seeing, you know, um, Penny and the firm, I guess, prioritizing between these asset classes? Yeah, um, it's a it's a difficult question, and we have that conversation all the time. And well, we definitely each have to answer the question of if your particular asset class. So, so I'll be the first to say that venture is a bit challenged lately. Uh, we can get into that, and uh, so I have to you know defend why venture first of all is a good asset class um, before talking about a specific opportunity. Uh, for now, I think we like the diversification and we think there are pockets of opportunity within each asset class, so within real estate, within private equity, within funds and within venture that are investable. So um, there's not a lot of discussions around that, but uh, I would say in each category, there's uh, you know forces that are uh, that, that, that are tailwinds and then forces that are headwinds. Um, so you asked about real estate. Uh, so real estate generally, I think it's cash flowing, it's a stable asset class, but you know, there's challenges in rising interest rates. So that's you know, the, on the consumer mortgage side, there's challenges on the commercial real estate side, given that we don't really know what office occupancy is gonna come back to. I think we see a it trending in the right way, but we don't know where it's going to end up. Um, and on the venture side too, it's uh, the bid ask is pretty wide in terms of uh, you know. So there's some great businesses out there where the valuation might just be uh, not quite adjusted, and we just have to be patient. Uh, but there are other opportunities when, for example, the company is starting out; they're young, and um, the it's the cost of capital is more expensive now, uh, which means they need to spend less money on things that don't quite have the ROI and arguably talent is cheaper now than it was back in 2021. So I would say in mm. each of these asset classes, you have the pros and cons and we just have to be good investors and weigh um, all of them as we think about investments. Yeah. So let's get into venture. Uh, you've built the practice over the last five years uh, mm -hmm. and counting, right? Five years and a couple of months. Yes. How have things changed? I mean, the markets are not in a good shape right now, especially at the stage that you're investing in, where it's north of 50% that has been uh, slashed. Are you timing the market at all? How are you thinking about investing this year compared to the high of the last two years? Yeah, it's definitely an interesting time. Um, and I would say, in general, we think this is a good thing that's happening to the industry. We think there's just been, um, I would say back in 2020, 2021, there was just a bunch of me too software companies that we really couldn't tell the difference between that business and a business that we just saw last week, but somehow they have 5 million in revenue and getting valued at like 500 million. So um, yeah. compared to that environment, I think we like the current one much better. Uh, in some ways, I think it's been, it was helpful in the last couple of years where we did have the checks and balances with from our real estate team and from our power equity team. When if your if your P and L and your cash flow are too out of whack compared to what you should be valued, then um, you know they will be the first to say it. Versus if we had a traditional venture group that's seeing ventures things all the time. So I think compared to some other funds, where our portfolio is in a relatively okay shape, we have some companies that are probably overvalued that we're managing, but generally I think our portfolio is okay. Um, as we think about new opportunities, I would say um, the bar is definitely higher. Uh, we're thankful that we don't have to say yes or no to a three-day diligence process anymore uh, without much data. Um, so we're taking our time, we're being patient, but we think for the right companies, again, this is a really great time to invest because 
you know, valuations are arguably lower for new opportunities. Um, cost of talent is arguably cheaper. And if you can show strong growth in this environment, that means you're getting corporate budgets at a time when corporate budgets are tightening. So if we look at a company that doubled um, from last year to this year, we'll probably give it more weight than a company that doubled from 2020 to 2021 uh, because every because cost of capital is free then and um, people were just throwing uh, money at innovation. Uh, so in some ways today, it's easier to tell who the winners are from the losers, uh, but we're definitely still active in trying to find as many winners as we can. Yeah, so what, what is going to differentiate for you? I mean, based on what you're seeing on the market now, between the haves and the have-nots. So I would say um, definitely ROI. What are you delivering to a customer that's, um, that has clear path to either savings or an efficiency uh, or something transformative? So we look at our investments in terms of, you know, I would say vertical software, horizontal software, and kind of game-changing transformative technology. Um, and I think for each of those categories, uh, we still see pockets when things are offline, manual, lack transparency. So there's there are solutions that have a place to exist. Um, and when we see that and we see you know, revenue doesn't lie. So when you see revenue kind of go hand in hand with a solution that we feel like is missing and much needed and solves a clear problem, I think they will still have a place in, in this world to exist. And what was your thesis and has it changed, I guess, when you started, you know, I, I think the approach was very, very much B2B SaaS, right? So horizontal mm -hmm. looking across uh, and you've even made uh, um, investment recently into a depth that we want to go into. But when you were thinking about B2B as a space and, you know, enterprise SaaS, how are you thinking about, you know, where the market was moving and why you were bullish about it? Yeah, so we yes, we still have a focus on, on B2B SaaS. And the reason we chose that as a focus is, um, as, as you heard, uh, Penny and PSP, we have lots of relationships um, and strong networks across many areas of the economy that we want to be able to unlock, um, use, and we call, you know, supercharge uh, a company's network um, and amplify the relationships that they already have. And so we didn't want to target a specific sector uh, because mm. our relationships are in many different sectors. But at the same time, we needed to have a focus to say, how do we then tell what best in class businesses are? And so having that business model focus was our way of um, being able to reach uh, our tentacles into many areas that we feel like innovation should be had, but also be focused and, and know what best businesses look like. And I would say those um, that hasn't really changed too much. Uh, so we're still looking for things, um, uh, for example, in vertical software, uh, mainly in old line industries that can still improve um, from efficiencies and workflow. So we have a couple, uh, say in the real estate side, um, that matches well with our with our history. VTS is a company on the on the leasing, asset management, tenant workflow side, open space, construction technology. You can automate progress tracking and see what's built and what's not. Um, a guide wheel, which gives you like a real time digital footprint of all your machinery and how they're performing. And so just to give you a flavor of that. And then horizontal software um, is things like uh, a web company called Isertus. Um, they're in the contract management space. Enable, uh, they're in the B2B deals. Um, uh, contract space and uh, so those kind of apply to all companies but they're the, the similar thing is things that were traditional and offline and bringing them online um, and then uh, Adept as you mentioned is a new AI company we invested in that falls within the transformative technology space that we feel like you know still has a lot of room to grow and run and um, maybe a little different um, than uh, how we think of vertical and horizontal software this is more game-changing technologies that's changing the way we interact with, with software and, and workflows. When you look across, uh, and we're looking at SaaS specifically, was there any specific um, patterns? I mean, we talk about pattern recognition within these different companies operating in a SaaS environment and B2B uh, that really makes them successful. Occasionally this will happen, but we rarely see companies that sort of couldn't find product market fit for many years and all of a sudden takes off. Um, so mm -hmm. early momentum is a big, area that we track. So 
for companies, you know, under 10 million of revenue for sure, but even I guess up to 25, if they're not at least doubling each year, we view that as a sign that something is maybe not quite right in terms of product market fit, and those can be hard to, to recover from. And so we're very much momentum investors in that we try to make a company that's growing well grow even faster. Um, and so seeing that repeatability uh, of revenue and seeing if they can continue to expand wallet share within one customer um, is also an important driver of stakiness and retention. And so from from those metrics that we can usually find the, the best in class businesses. How have you seen companies build virality across uh, B2B SaaS? I mean, that's one of the big um, key metrics that we all look at, right? You know, the stickiness, are they growing in wallet share? Is there virality in the user base, especially when they're addressing an ecosystem? Uh, what were some of your, I guess, highlights of how businesses have figured this out that you were impressed by? I think a big part of it is ease of use. Uh, so, uh, so, so many, so many times in B2B software, the onboarding process with the sales cycle can be a lot harder and not longer than versus a consumer business, right? When virality is much easier to, or at least much faster to achieve. Um, and so we love looking at technologies of, uh, I would describe it as a um, very intuitive and straightforward user interface, um, but a very complex, complex backend. Um, so, uh, if if something is hard to use and people are hard to figure out, one is hard for your investors to figure out too. So I think uh, from a fundraising perspective, that's also harder. Um, but from a customer's perspective, if they can't see it, touch it, and then be able to use it and see value from it immediately, um, then you have an uphill battle. Uh, at the same time, if your workflow is too simple and you, it, it's much easier for someone else to copy it. There's limited barriers to entry. You have a different set of problems. Um, you might have the viral nature, but someone else can have it too. Uh, so we really look for that combination of things that are intuitive but complex backend. I think um, I think our company Open Space is a good uh, illustration of this. Where I mean, capturing um, progress on a construction site in the real world is pretty difficult, and so for them to be able to have you either use a camera, attach it to your hard hat, or put, put it anywhere where you can just continue to do your job as you normally would, but all this is passively captured in the background and uploaded for you was a big piece of how they grew so quickly. It's because it's so easy to use. One of my favorite events of the year is coming up. I'm talking about HubSpot's annual inbound conference in Boston, and I think you'll love it too. So mark your calendars for September 5th through the 8th, 2023. Catch talks from amazing spotlight talent like Reese Witherspoon, Stephen Bartlett, and Andrew Huberman. And there's so much more with multiple stages featuring industry experts and tracks from sales strategy to AI and innovation. You'll walk away with practical tips that you can put into action right away. Plus, you'll connect with other leaders from some of the most exciting and innovative companies in the world. This year is going to be unforgettable. Tickets are selling out fast, so head over to inbound.com to get yours today. Speaking of complexity, yet ease of use, of course, uh, there's no conversation without a mention of ChatGPT and you just invested into Adept. Uh, it's just been a couple of days since the testimony of Sam Altman you know, here in D.C., what are your thoughts here on B2B SaaS applications of AI? Is this a good or bad thing? Are we you know, over our skis at this time? So it's the billion dollar question, right? <laughs> That's and, right. Um, so uh, I would say, you know, first of all, um, I'm really happy that Sam Altman is um, testifying and it's a very important conversation for all of us to have. Um, I think AI will be transformative. I think it's been compared to the invention of PC, internet, mobile, cloud, and maybe even surpassing that. So. There's a lot of good things that can be done with it, especially on the productivity front. And we're certainly seeing that with our investment in Adept, um, where they're automating much of what how you engage with software. Um, at the same time, right, like with, with any technology this powerful, you need to have responsible AI, where you need to have regulation, where you need to have some guidelines around so it doesn't um, go into the negative territory. And I think we're all trying to figure out what that is. I don't think anyone has answers to those questions, but I think sort of at a very basic level, right? Like AI should be, inventions in AI should protect privacy. Um, it should be safe. Uh, it should 
be accurate. It should not discriminate, right? You have these basic principles um, as uh, for for our society that that should be there. Who does it? I think it's more than government uh, that plays a role. I think it's all of our companies, um, it's our founders, it's our civic organizations. I, everyone should play a role in how these guidelines are formed, and I think we'll see how that be formed. But I think having a conversation first and foremost is the most important. Um, I don't think you know we're at the place where tomorrow robots are going to take over the world. But I do think, and this is what you know, Sam also said in his testimony, is um, the the scariest thing for me for AI is the, in the immediate term is misinformation. So we already saw some of the challenges with fake news and people not knowing what to believe yeah. and what to read. And if you think about if AI can now generate a real high quality, believable image of you or me saying things that we didn't say, like those implications, I think are very scary and very much on our doorstep as opposed to, you know, who knows when robots will actually be here. Yeah. So what made you say yes to adapt? So for one, if we stay on this topic of regulation, uh, they're solving a business productivity issue. So mm -hmm. think of them as automating what we do in software. So as opposed to logging a particular contact in Salesforce, you just type in a box, please log this contact, and they'll know exactly which fields, how to log in, and click OK. Um, you can also think of it as type in ex submit expense report. And so it kind of pulls all the data from your expenses and submits it. So compared to fake news, right, it's, it's a little bit safer. Um, and at the same time, it can really increase your productivity uh, in a I'm sure there are some downsides to every solution, but Adept was one that we felt like it was transformative enough on the business and productivity case without sort of having an immediate detriment on our consumer day to day. Yeah, so if, if I may dig a little bit deeper here before we go to billion dollar questions, we talked about this beginning of, of this uh, interview about um, how important it is to look at the founder. Right. And especially in, in the realms that you're working with, Adept as an example, OK, they're submitting expense reports and probably pulling that data from your email. Right. So I've seen different versions of this, but they are calling through, you know, potentially personal information, very uh, private stuff that then, you know, they have access to. So it's it's up to the founder to think about, you know, what are the limits here? What are the ethics here? When you think about as an investor investing into founders, tackling sort of the unknown unknowns and ethics and all these things. What makes you confident in this founder that, yes, this person, you know, when faced with difficult situations, will be able to make the right decision? Yeah, um, I mean, a lot of it uh, comes from, you know, asking them about their values and their philosophies. Uh, and for founders that are conscious of the of the topic of ethics and, and how do you invent responsibly, even if they might not have all the answers yet, the fact that they have intention to figure it out, to hire team members that help them figure it out, um, to be aware of it is, is step one. Uh, a lot of people, it's not necessarily top of mind for them and it can you can tell in the conversations that you have. Um, and then the other thing is uh, the founding team at Adept uh, came from OpenAI. And so they were sort of at the forefront of a lot of this AI innovation. And so to have that perspective, to have the team, to have the resources that are living and breathing these AI topics um, gives us some comfort that at least they are knowledgeable and aware uh, of the different dimensions, if you will, of the pros and cons of AI, and then they can make drive them to make a better decision. But you can never, I guess, a hundred percent be sure. Um, so you do you do your best to make a to make a judgment call. Yeah, and so this actually points to questions that you as an investor ask in diligence, right? What have you learned to be very important questions, like non-negotiable questions an investor has to ask uh, before a deal is done? So we are, you know, we're very data-driven um, investors. And so we ask for data in all shapes and forms, and uh, we verify them, and um, even for earlier stage companies that don't have a lot of data, we, we're we pretty strict on that front. And I think, again, that's probably part of our real estate PE DNA too. Um, and so we are not the type of investors that just back an idea after one conversation. So from that point, we've always been really diligent. And it's not necessarily like this is one piece of specific information that 
makes or breaks the deal, but it's really how a founder communicates and shares information that's really important. Um, you, we, we've had conversations where from the first or the second conversation, uh, they're an open book in terms of what do you want to see? What do you want to know? We understand your capital is valuable. We need to be good stores of capital. So whatever you need, we're going to get you. Um, and usually those founders, after we make the investment, are much better about transparency, about sending regular investor updates, being available whenever we need updates. Uh, on the flip side, we have definitely had conversations where uh, within 10 minutes of a conversation, the founder goes, we're oversubscribed. So either you're in or you're out. Um, and for all those we've said, we're, we're out. And what we've heard is that even if somehow you get comfortable with the investment, going forward, anytime you want information, anytime you want to share an update, it's like pulling teeth. Uh, yeah. So it's less about like one piece of information we must have, it's more just how their, their philosophy and their demeanor of sharing information. Yeah, that's fascinating. And well, so many questions, Momi, that I could, you know, continue on with you, but we are time limited here. So this is the fun part, billion dollar questions, okay. uh, quick questions, you know, quick fire questions. First thing that comes to mind, all right? Okay, okay. All right, your guilty pleasure. Ooh, I have a lot of them. I would say uh, drinking champagne in an airport lounge, which I know oh. sounds really odd, uh, but I think we are so back to back in all of our days that one, um, having downtime is hard to come by, uh, but two, the, the beauty of waiting at an airport lounge be before your flight is no one expects you to be productive during that time. It's really, it's much, it's like easily wasted time, but instead it creates the space that I need to unwind and actually generate creative thoughts. So many of my best ideas came from airport lounges. I love the airport lounge. And yes, that is a habit that I like. Um, well, a habit that you pick up, pick, you've picked up other than champagne at the airport lounge that has changed your life for the better. I'm not sure how applicable this is to the wider audience, but um, so I'm a morning person and my most productive times is when I first wake up and it kind of deteriorates during the day. And so I have learned to sleep in chunks. So it's a little less actionable when I'm, you know, working, uh, uh, but sort of, you know, when, if I can sleep in three hour chunks and then wake up and have another productive session and then take another, I guess, power, power nap, if you will, three to four hours and then wake up again, I get doses of energy every time I wake up. Um, so that's my way of unlocking productivity. If it does wake, uh, you know, work with my schedule, it's also helped as I have two young children and you know, lots of sleepless nights, lots of waking up, but that actually gives me the power naps that I need to then wake up and be productive. What would you tell your younger self? Well, the first thing I would tell my younger self is to put all my savings into the 12 year bull market <laughs> that we had for stocks. Uh, that if I could turn back time, I would tell myself that. Um, but then I would say um, also that you know, learn how to communicate at an early age. Uh, it's one of those quote unquote soft skills that's hard to teach and hard to learn, but it's important in all areas of life, whether that's your professional life, when you're trying to drive um, one of your agendas or try to be influential or your personal life when there's just a lot of moving pieces. I think having great um, verbal and written communication can be the best thing that you train yourself to do at a young age. What's your biggest insecurity? My kids. So mm. I've, uh, I've always had this mentality of playing to win, um, not play to lose, uh, act like you have nothing to lose and you can take a lot of risks and be bold. But with kids, you have a lot to lose. Uh, having kids is scary. There are little versions of you running around and I'm always worried, uh, are they safe? Are they happy? Are they being bullied? Are they gonna, how are they gonna grow up? Am I being a good mother? So yeah, all, all the insecurities that I never had in the first phase of life all came out when I had my kids. Mm. And that brings me to a really good question from the previous episode, VC Martina Welkoff. For you, how do you decide on the boundaries of your sacrifices? So I think the one pitfall that I would advise others and as well as myself um, is don't try to measure yourself on a daily basis. So, so many times I see mothers or other, others that are juggling a bunch of things together where they're like, hey, every day I have to set aside time for 
my kids, my work, my friends, my family, and they just get really overwhelmed. Um, so I've learned to be okay with sprints where, hey, maybe for a week I'm trying to close a deal and it's okay if I need to um, have a family take care of my kids for almost that entire week. And then there are other times when say the deal is closed and portfolio is in a good shape, then I devote all my time to my family, uh, whether that's a vacation or whether it's a set amount of time. So being okay with um, uh, not necessarily need to be everything to everyone all the time, but being okay with being all in on whatever's most important um, and most pressing at the time, I think has been something that's been really helpful. Yeah, love that. And finally, um, my next guest after you would be uh, Jeff, who is the CEO of Coursera. Oh, what awesome. question I, would you yeah, have for him? And he, and he worked. Yeah, he's great. And he's, you know, got a great background with financial engines, right? With a Nobel yeah. Prize winner. Uh, what question would you have for him? Billion dollar question. Billion dollar question. Um, if you weren't in the career that you are at today, what's a dream job that you had as a kid? Or what else would you be doing? Oh, love that. Love that. Well, Momi, thank you so much for your time. This was excellent. I will be sure to put that question uh, to Jeff and send it to you. I'm excited to hear what he says as well. <laughs> I'm excited as well. Uh, no, I uh, thank you for having me on here. This has been a lot of fun um, and yeah. really appreciated and really honored too to be a, a guest on this show because I've seen um, what incredible people have been on here before. Thank you, Momi. Well, I'm excited to keep seeing your billion dollar moves. And thanks so much for tuning in this week. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and follow our socials on Sarah Chen Global to get the latest on the show. It would really help me out too if you enjoyed this to rate and review our show on Apple Podcasts and share your favorite episodes with a friend. I'm Sarah Chen Spellings and you've been listening to Billion Dollar Moves.